Hello, everybody. I am Sheree Adams, and I am on the steering committee at Directors Lab West. I am going to describe myself for you. I'm wearing a black shirt, a black and white shirt, a white necklace made of beads. My background describes the speakers of this conversation and has the hashtag Directors Lab West Connects. What is Directors Lab West Connects? I'm glad you asked. Directors Lab West is a 20-year-old all-volunteer-run organization that produces an annual eight-day intensive lab. It's full of workshops, panels, master classes, and more. It's for mid-career directors and choreographers, and they come from all over the world. Well, the pandemic put a wrench in that. However, refusing to be thwarted, we chose to mark the lab this year with Directors Lab West Connects an online version of the lab. Needless to say, we've been overwhelmed by your responses. So here we are. Welcome to eight days of conversations crafted for and by theater directors and choreographers, live streamed by our partners at HowlRound to their website and to our Directors Lab West Facebook page. There you can join the chat. Tell us who you are and where you're tuning in from and ask questions for the Q&A following our speaker's conversation. Very special thanks to Alan Witt Witteborg for providing ASL interpretation. He is wearing a gray shirt. He has a beard and he has a pale face. Uh, you can also head over to our Facebook page for audio captioning if you like. I'm very excited to welcome our speakers today, Luis Alfaro and Lori Woolery. We asked them to talk together today about their work with their communities and how it's changed post-COVID. We are also curious about how teaching has changed during COVID and what changes they have made to the process because of it. Luis Alfaro is an award-winning playwright who divides his life between working in regional theater and community-based art throughout the United States. He recently finished his sixth season tenure as the playwright in residence at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. He teaches at University of Southern California, and before all this went down, he had a pretty good run at the Magic Theater, St. Louis Repertory Theater, and two seasons in a row at the Public Theater in New York. Speaking of the Public Theater, Lori Woolery is the Director of Public Works there. If you're not familiar, it is a wonderful program that seeks to engage the people of New York by making them creators and not just spectators. She is also a director, playwright, citizen artist. She's the former associate artistic director of Cornerstone Theater Company and the conservatory director at South Coast, Coast Repertory. Might not know this, but she develops new work with diverse communities, ranging from incarcerated women to residents in a Kansas town who were devastated by a tornado. Luis and Lori, welcome. They will be in conversation for the next 30 minutes and then return with some questions hot off the Facebook chat. I'll see you all soon. Thank you so much, Sheree. My name is Luis Alfaro and I am um, a middle-aged queer Latino man who uh, was recently shaven this morning and I gave myself a, a, a COVID haircut. So I'm feeling a little uh, messy, but uh, a little cleaned up as well. Hi, Lori. Hi, hey, Luis. Uh, I'm ageless. I'm Lori Woolery. I'm ageless. I am wearing a, um, uh, a, a top, a moth colored top, and I am letting my COVID roots show. So I wear glasses and I am happy to be here talking to my friend. I'm so happy to be here with you, Lori. I thought maybe uh, before we even started, I should say that I clocked for uh, myself and for everybody um, that you and I have known each other for 28 years formally. I was a child. You were a child and I was a child too. You were my very first professional play. Me. What? <laughs> I think you taught me. No. <laughs> no. Every day, Louise. You were in my very first professional play at South Coast Repertory and you were an actor. And this was the first professional play I had written 28 years ago. I don't know if people realize it when they ask us to talk together, um, uh, they realize how close and intimate we are as actual friends uh, for the last two, three decades. So I'm excited about this conversation. 
Yeah, because they're going to be expecting pros and they're just going to get cheese may, right? That's all. Yeah, definitely. We're all gossip. These are our late night calls you're all invited into. So it's just happening mid morning. Um, all gossip all the time. Yeah. I was thinking this morning as we started, um, I've been meditating a lot about this past week watching the presentations. And one of the presentations that uh, really took me was um, the Jessica Hanna and Bogart conversation. Partly, uh, I really loved uh, Ann Bogart's uh, definition of, of what we needed right now, the three things we needed, the triptych we needed in order to get through this moment, which was passion, point of view, and craft. And even more uh, interesting to me was uh, Jessica Hanna talking about, um, I don't know, starting from a place that I don't know. And today we're having a conversation about community, you and I, and I don't know is usually the place I start from. Do you relate to that in any way? 10,000% always. I think it's the reason why, I don't think, I know it's the reason why I stay doing this work is to truly step into a space of not knowing and to, uh, step into a space of what are we going to create together um, and to um, find out something else about the world and others and myself that I don't know, which is pretty thrilling and pretty kind of counterintuitive also to our field. Yeah, I agree. You know, I, I was thinking about when we but when I was getting ready to do this, I was thinking that one of the things that I've always done when I've gone into new communities is that vulnerable act of saying, I am the most ignorant person in this room. Please tell me, tell me uh, what I should know. And it is the, the, the first portal, right, into not just a community, but to, to friendships, into uh, being vulnerable as artists need to be. And mm -hmm. I was thinking about how 30 years later, it translates into my teaching. That one of the first things I do with students is I don't, uh, I don't uh, teach, right? I don't uh, give information. I don't uh, pass on anything first. The first thing I always say is, um, who are you? Who are your people? And if we can be so bold, what are your dreams? Which is a lot to ask of somebody, right? A stranger, especially. But um, I love the results of what that does to us. And, and in some ways it is um, for me, uh, the, not the beginning of a teacher student relationship, but the beginning of an art making relationship. Yeah, I also love the question in that those introductory moments of, um, tell us something we don't know about you by looking at you. And I always tease it out a little bit more saying, and even if, if you have friends in this room, they can't know it either. So oh, really just trying to up it so that there's this thing that we used to talk about at uh, Cornerstone. And I know that I, I hold on to it all the time is the insider outsider perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what you're talking about when you're saying like the most ignorant person in the room is like walking in going, you are the experts of your community. Like, you know, what's happening here. I'm, I might think I know, but I don't know, you know? And so how, how often do we get to be uh, in a beginner's mind? I had, um, and she continues to be just somebody I, I think about all the time. One of my teachers, Denise Taylor, who really taught me the, um, the phrase beginner's mind. And I didn't quite understand it when I, was you know a young artist trying to find out figure out my way through it but it is something that i hold into um not just every community i go to but every class i step into every room i step into i try to with humility and um try to be egoless in in that but also in the rehearsal room is going you know how can i, I you know i've done all the prep that I can do on my own or with my designers, but now the actors are gonna step in and the, and the dramaturg are gonna be in conversation and all of us together are going to bring our life experience into the room and how the work resonates for us. And that is always such a rich and delicious place to be. So um, uh, I think what's so great about the classroom is it just, you get to practice it all the time. And in rehearsal, you're lucky to, you get to practice it when you get a gig, you know? And so, and then I think in our everyday jobs, it's, you know, 
regardless of whether it's theater or not, is how can we continue to practice those skills? Um, you know, especially now in COVID, it's like, all I got is me. And that is like, at me and Zoom. But um, it's, you know, it, it's hard when you're like spending so much of your time in relationship to other people and, and really wanting to, and depending upon that conversation. Mm. I love what you're saying because I, uh, one of the things I adore about you in the room is that those first moments are really the moments to uh, open up the possibility of a room, right? The possibility of how much excellence is gonna happen in a rehearsal room is really built in uh, pulling back rather than jumping in and taking over, you know? Mm -hmm. And I love, for me as a playwright, I'm gonna just, I think I wanna affirm something you said is that I listen very closely in those first few moments because I love writing for actors. I think that's one of my gifts. Mm -hmm. And I love adapting my text to the actor's strength, right? And also the actor's challenges. Sometimes you hear an actor talk and you think, I better not use this word or I better like pull back on the S's or whatever it is, right? And sometimes it's technical, but sometimes it's also really philosophical, right? And so I think about how I enter the room and what I'm gonna learn in the silence of my empathy, right? In the, in the meditation that I'm doing while I'm also actively listening. And I think uh, it's not a surprise to me that you and I both do theater work. We are in the academy because we're also mentors and mentees, but we also are community builders, right? So all of those are this, uh, I think I'm using a lot of the same skill sets to do the work. I think of the classroom as the rehearsal space. I always say to the students at the top, I'm not going to treat you like a student. I'm gonna treat you like a, a colleague in a, in a production. So mm -hmm. let us figure out what that relationship is, right? Yeah, absolutely. And how we talk to each other. Cause you know, you can be passionate about something and you wanna be able to express that fully and completely, but also being able to understand and read the room about how your passion is uh, received. So, uh, and, and I think because so much of my life has been about trying to like, let's keep that contained, that I want to be able to like, let that live in a space that we have collectively set up that is safe. So one of the, you know, one of the big ones for me is just like assuming goodwill, mm. you know, when we're in the space is like hearing, I mean, I just think it's a good life one overall is assume goodwill. Um, you know, I just think it's helpful um, because you can you can load in all your other stuff that you're bringing into your life into it and make assumptions about people, which is why this work is humbling to the ego because you have to check yourself and going, don't think that you know, like you might know, but you might know, you might learn something else. and. You know, I teach because I, I teach because it's also kind of a selfish act because they teach me so much. My, my students, my community have taught me how to be an artist because, you know, for those, some of the people who, who know me really well know that, you know, I will say my dirty hidden secret is I don't have pedigree in terms of I did not go to the top institutions. I've never taken a directing class in my life you know, um, but I didn't even think I wanted to be a director, but community shaped me. And I just found myself in rooms and saying yes to the experience of like, oh yeah, sure, Jose Cruz, I'll help you do the neighborhood conservatory at South Coast Rep, you know, I'll, I'll assist you. And then it evolved into all these kids showing up and me being thrust into being a teacher and, I remember him saying to me, you know, I'm like, I, you know, he was, he was a great lesson. And I will share this story just because we thought 20 kids were going to show up. It was in a community center in Santa Ana. And we were just hoping 20 kids would show up and 120 kids showed up. Right. And I turned to him and I'm like, oh my God, we're going to have to turn away a hundred kids. And he's like, no, hold on. Give me a second. And he's like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to divide up the room. And he started just saying, like, you take half of them. I'll take half of them. We'll divide them up. We'll have these kids for this hour. We'll do have multiple classes going. And I'm like, I'm not a teacher. And he's, you know, more than they do. And then he just started counting off the room. 
And it was the greatest lesson in one, pushing me off the high dive, but he trusted that I could do it and that I wasn't, I wanted to be prepared. And sometimes you just have to do it and learn in the moment. But he also showed me how um, not to be so rigid with your rules or your expectations. Like whoever shows up is who shows up. And, you know, it's loaves and fish, you know, to get biblical here. It's like, we can feed everybody. And so how do we do that with what we have? Well, you teach what you need to learn, right? In some way, you know, uh, every year I say to myself, okay, now I'm going to go back into the field and concentrate 100% of my time as a working artist. But in truth, I am doing that because teaching is part of learning, right? Teaching that every student right. brings something to the experience that is a surprise. Um, I have an exercise. I just don't want to run away too far away from it because I believe very strongly in Joe Chaikin's The Presence of the Actor. I think every director, every writer, every playwright, uh, every actor should read this book. It's, it's small and short, but he has a series of questions of character, he calls them, when he builds a character. And the first question is, what is the one thing that people cannot see when they look at you? And I do that at the start of every semester, right? And sometimes it's very um, something very surface, but there's always one student who will turn out to be that shining student who will say something that's very true and very deep and very real about the world that we live in, right? That helps me shift the classroom from art to a citizen work, which is, I think, one of the things that you and I do a lot of, right? We are artist citizens and we are engaging in a kind of social discussion in the academy, in the theater, and in our lives. So I'm really moved by this idea that uh, what we're really doing is building up community uh, outside of the space, the building, right? Outside of the theater, we are really building a community of uh, artists who are also citizens and at the same time are trying to figure out how to use that work, their gift to build something bigger in our uh, in our culture. So yeah, I, or who have never felt that they could, e even if they had a tiny glimmer of a like, like, oh, wouldn't that be cool? Oh, but no, is to open up a space, you know, to create a true invitation for people to step up and step into, you know, and I can't say that I intuitively knew that going in that, these tools that have revealed themselves to me have been revealed to me through being present with community mm. in a shared space as to what do you want? What do you need? What do you desire? What are you looking for? You know, what do you want from me? You know, um, uh, that, that for me always shapes um, a classroom, but it also shapes a rehearsal room and a process. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm thinking a little bit about, um, you know, we, we talked previously just, uh, I was going to surprise you by saying, when, where's the God in all of this, right? But in some way, you've already kind of mentioned it. And I think one of the things that I'm very excited about right now, especially in this pandemic time, is where is the spirit in all of this, right? Um, in some ways, I'm being guided by spirituality. What does that mean, right? I'm being guided by something bigger than me in this moment that's allowing me to be a bigger artist than I've ever been. Bigger artist in the sense that I have to be really, really creative about how I do the work and not lose sight of the work that I do, right? Yeah. And, and I wonder if you have thoughts about just, you, you, because you work with hundreds of community members who are, um, who you bring into a space, but also you go visit their spaces a lot. Is, is What are you thinking about the, the notion of what's happening right now with the loss, the sense of uh, displacement? There is so much going on. And, you know, it's just especially today, what a violent day in our country, right? Uh, uh, purposely so. But I'm um, wondering how we move through these moments and not forget that um, we are artists. Right. And how do we use the art to... Um, share, um, it, like I, you know, I just shared with my staff this morning is I, for the last several weeks, I have felt this 
it always feels like something is standing on my chest, mm -hmm. you know, this mm -hmm. pressure. And, you know, I've gone like, is it gas? Is it acid reflux? Is it loneliness? Is it despair? Is it anxiety? You know, and I think it is, um, you know, it's being in a city that is the epicenter of the virus, um, the 100,000 souls, uh, being in a neighborhood uh, that is primarily Black and walking the streets and seeing how this, my neighborhood is affected by what is happening. I mean, the last couple of days there has been such shouting outside my my windows, people yelling at each other. And, um, and, you know, we're all in our little boxes in these little containers and it is going to be a hot summer. And, you know, here in New York, just talking to our community partner leaders, it's like the funding for all the after school or I mean the summer programming has dried up. And so our community partners are trying to find ways of like, you know, we are going to do programming for our teens and our youth because we've got to make sure that they are not on the street where like the funding for arts has gone down, but the funding for police have gone up. Like this, it, we see this as potentially being a, 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 pow, a powder keg, you know? Mm. And so in this moment, like, you know, I was raised of service. Like, what are you doing for your community? You know, what are you doing for your family? What are you doing for your friends? What are you doing for your community? So it's so interesting that art never felt like it was um, a party I was invited to or a place that I should be spending my time, which literally like my family would be like, why, why are you doing that? Like, that's, you know, be of service. And so I feel like uh, community and teaching has, and also being a director has, you know, I do feel like it, it that's why I call it a citizen artist. I do feel like it is of service. You know, we are, we, we, we can tell the stories of our community and invite our community into being a part of not only telling those stories and witnessing those stories, but some, some level of participation around it. You know, and our community partner organizations are struggling. And so in this moment of wanting to produce and do things, make art, um, I have found that I've just, and the team, we've just gone, okay, we gotta listen to what community needs. Like, what do they need right now? How can we serve them and meet them where they need in this moment so that also when we come back, that we showed up for them. We were truly, truly good neighbors and good partners. So, but again, you know, what does that look like can only be revealed in conversation, you know, and by turning to them and saying, what is it that you need? What can we do to highlight what it is that you need? What can we do to provide? And the things that have come up have been food, hygiene, technology, and what they're saying creativity, but for me, I interpret that as spirit because that is where the sacred lives is in the creative. And so people are needing to find a way to tap into their spirit in this moment. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just think theater is, story is the perfect way to do that. But it can't be as we, think because we're leaving a lot of people out if we just rely upon technology. Because for us, our elders aren't Zooming, you know? And for a lot of people, they don't actually have access. They've relied upon the libraries or the cafes or, I mean, honestly, up until the pandemic, I didn't have internet in my house. You know, uh, not for lack of not being able to afford it, but it's just like you can get away with not having it. Um, but that was a whole lot, a whole lot of. But when you're talking about where's the God, where's the spirit in the work, is I think it also goes back to what you're talking about: is how do we show up and listen and see what is this opportunity presenting us with? Mm, mm, mm. You know, clearly things have not been working. 
I think I shared with you my big joke is like mother nature is like going, okay, you all are getting a big time out. Go to your rooms, think about what you've done. I'm going to do a little cleanup and then we're going to let you back out when this is over. <laughs> but it's like how to be awake during this time. And, you know, I can't say that I have the answers. I'm forming questions and I'm trying to listen and I'm um, trying to show up and be present. Um, but I do often feel the pressure of what it is to be an artist in the American theater. And it's like, oh, I should be writing that thing that I was going to be writing, or I should be creating that thing that I kept saying, or I should be reading all those books that I said I was going to, uh, wanted to get to. Um, what about you? Yeah, I feel like I'm going backwards, not backwards in that I'm not accumulating, I'm actually going back because back is the really wonderful place to go to your roots, your base as an artist, right? So for me, you know, I started in poetry for 10, 10 years and then I was in the performance art world. And in performance art training, we had a, a really wonderful uh, living theater exercise we used to do called um, deliberation. And the act of doing nothing, you're always doing something. Mm -hmm. What a great thing to sort of like hit on now, right? In the act of doing nothing, you're always doing something. And my teacher, Scott Gelman, used to say to us, um, move towards the thing that needs you the most. Move towards the thing that needs you the most. So I am in a very, I'm in the densest neighborhood of all of Los Angeles County. I live in Koreatown. Uh, of Los Angeles is 66 neighborhoods. This is the one that's most crowded. 50% uh, of the people in my neighborhood are Latino, 25% are Korean, and then a mix. But 94% of the people in my neighborhood are renters. So when I get up at five o'clock in the morning thinking I'm going to do my walk and uh, avoid anybody who might infect me in any way, I actually i am walking straight out into a ton of people in uniforms and working class outfits who are essential workers. Yeah. So in the beginning, I thought, hmm, wow, this is really pushing me somewhere I don't want to go, or this is pushing me somewhere that I don't understand. But I started to understand that during the, until very, very recently, I was an, a, a, an essential worker too. I'm cradling 75 students who are all over the world. I have a student who's getting up at two o'clock in the morning for her regular class, right? because she's now in another part of the world. And mostly my specialty is uh, international students, right? And so I am realizing that there is a lot of trauma. So not all my students, as you were saying, uh, have access the way I have access. So I don't always see my yeah. students because they're sharing space, uh, a single room with an entire family. Yeah. So they opt to, you know, mute out or video out and I'm okay with that. Right. So there, uh, you have to be present. You have to be here. I need you to be here and I need to know that you're here. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about being here, but it's very, very important to recognize that um, as I'm in the place that I'm living, the reality of where I live informs how I need to move through the world as an artist. Right. I'm in a really crowded neighborhood. So my first you know, few weeks of, uh, of the pandemic was trying to figure out how to just do very basic things without sort of being, um, uh, without sort of interrupting the neighborhood life that I had, right? Um, and I'm so proud of us because as, as Sheree comes back on, I was thinking that uh, we didn't go into mul multiple languages like we could. So uh, bless, bless that poor sign language guy. Thank God we didn't do that. <laughs> Hi, I'm back. I wanted to let that you know. That was fast. That was, wasn't it? It seems so very fast. fast. I could listen to you for hours, honestly. Um, so we're getting amazing questions on the live feed, and we also had some amazing questions when people signed up originally um, with the Eventbrite. So is it okay if we ask some questions? Sure, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So this one's for Lori. I think it's a fascinating question. Um, what skill, other than directing, of course, helps you be a better director? Well, um, I would say I was born into an ensemble because I come from a family of five siblings and uh, I was the fourth of that. So you had to learn to play and negotiate, and you, you know, and we were all like, this, like my poor mom, we were all together. 
Um, but I, so I always say that that was like my first place was being just a part of an, a family ensemble. And then I started off as an actor. And so, and an actor who um, had no other desire, I wanted to write and act. That was like what I was hoping to do. But I will say that um, uh, as, you know, being um, Latinx and with the last name Woolery and people like not quite sure who I was and was I Latin enough or what was what was I, um, you know, as a, a, a young, woman coming up as an actor, it was very confusing because I already didn't feel I was invited to the party. And then to be affirmed that I was, there really wasn't a place for me. And if you think you're Latin, you're not really Latin, but that had never been an issue before I started being an artist. Like I never questioned whether I was, you know, Latina enough. Like I just was, I was just who I am. And that's my mother's family. That's who we spent all our time with. Spanish was spoken in my you know, with my mother and my theas all the time. So I would have to say that it's like that being an actor and not feeling safe in rooms, not feeling seen in rooms made me want to, I brought that then to my teaching, you know, where it's like, I want to create a space where people can um, feel safe and can then take risks which then bled into when you're teaching, it's like, oh gosh, now you have to direct them in something. And then oftentimes it was like, I was working with you know young people of color. It was like, okay, I'm not gonna do the Disney fair, so let's create something. So, I mean, I'm totally dating myself, but this was at the time before I knew the word devised. You know, I didn't, there was not community engaged, community-based theater. It was just like, these were my people. These were the, I was looking in the faces of kids that looked like me, um, or who, um, you know, were kids of color that were just like, why should I care? Why should I want to engage? You know, what is this about? And me trying to say, no, come on in, come into it. And that all of, all of it is what I bring into a rehearsal room and hopefully what I bring into a leadership space. Um, you know, which is where for me, the term citizen artist comes in because it brings it all in. I, you know, in the facilitated conversations I have or in the, um, uh, uh, when you're in a room and you discover you're the only person of color, like there's a responsibility to speak up because you know all the other people that are um, uh, depending upon you to do it. So I would say all of those skills have uh, helped me in everything that I've done. I could, I'm not smart enough to have plotted out a career path. You know, Bill Roush used to always say, what is your one, three, five year journey? I'm like, I don't even know what I'm having for lunch. Like I, I'm not plotting it out. Like I wish I was smarter than that. But <laughs> what I was smart is saying yes and being curious and following that curiosity. Uh, very interesting. You're both online teaching now, correct? And is it, I mean, it must be really hard. I've heard it's very, very hard. Is there anything that you do in particular? And I know you spoke about this in the beginning, but what can teachers out there do that teach theater to engage the online students and to reach communities that don't have the technology? Is there anything that can be done to help that? I'm going to first start to you, Louise, because you've been doing it more, and I can explain it from a different end from how we've been doing it. I think okay. when it started, I, I one of the, the first things I was inspired by was the, the fact that I was not going to be able to teach, let's say, acting online. I just don't believe that you can do that. But I can teach you everything leading up to it. We can, <laughs> we can read all the great texts. We can do all the character work. We can do all the great research. And the research includes the exercises of acting, right? But we can do all of that stuff. So something very unique happened to me. I was teaching um, MFA one actors text analysis and we were reading these in person, reading these extraordinary, very complicated plays I found that were avant-garde plays. So we were talking about language and cut up text and the whole thing. But when we took it online, it was way too hard. So, you know, I'm a playwright and I wrote every student in my class a four to five page long monologue that looked, that took a challenge, that took a strength and that took some of their biography 
and put it in the monologue. And that is what we did for culminations. Together, we edited that from five pages long to one page, but we did that as a dramaturgical analysis exercise, right? We worked together as uh, colleagues, as collaborators in taking that text and doing something with it. And I'm super, super proud about that because I knew I could not do the thing that I was doing, but I could still do theater. I could still do the thing leading up to it so that when we come back into the room, we didn't lose a year, right? We actually did something even deeper, which is I never get to do those great exercises. Like I have a, just the simplest exercise, which is take your character's age and half, figure out what the event was in their life that causes them to live their life the way they're living now. We, we rarely get to do that, right? And in rehearsal, you're already at like, you know, um, doing blocking, showing the blocking for the stumble through for the designers, right? But here's something that's really meditative, that's really important about motivation and about what a, what a character does in a play that makes logical sense, that informs an emotional life. I know it sounded a little, but what I oh, love about it. Oh, good. But what I love about it is for, for the class, we're getting really deep, deep in emotional and intellectual thoughts. So I'm finally able to marry these in a way that I have enough time to marry them, right? You turn it into an opportunity. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I, I looked at Zoom and I was sort of terrified for one day. And then, you know, I, I, I was telling somebody the other day, I said, you know, the whole pandemic has completely switched for me. I was thinking, what am I most afraid of? Food insecurity? I grew up with that. I grew up in the ghetto. I grew up in Pico Union. Um, am, I, am I worried about like, you know, isolation? I grew up in a gang infested neighborhood that where we just constantly had to go in when there was violence in my neighborhood. So I was thinking, I know all of this. I know all of this. And what do you make with it? What do you make with it? And what we make is art. Yeah. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. That's the that's the spirit. Yes. That's the guy. I mean, and can you imagine like friends like Luis Alfaro wrote you a monologue? Like it's like <laughs> they don't even know, do they? They don't even know what But you know what was really good about that exercise that I will say that was the most amazing thing? I have a student who's from Puerto Rico and he's been really struggling in the US. He loves Shakespeare. And you know, I think he came late to Raul Julia and that documentary, right? And so it was really interesting, but he was struggling, he was crying, the whole thing. And one day we had a, I wrote him this monologue and in the monologue, he says, I realized something about myself. I forgot to bring me off the island. I forgot to bring me to the, to the States. I forgot to bring me into this place. Uh, Shakespeare is not a language that any of us, you know, is not an accent that any of us have. So why am I ignoring the thing that I have, my own love of poetry and language? why am I ignoring that? And I put all of that into the monologue. That was completely instinctual, but you know, that is his monologue. I mean, he he fed that, he, gave, he made that, right? I just put the words in, but he was the one who created the spirit and the environment to uh, make that piece of art happen. And he was so happy at the end. I was so happy because I thought, this is what collaboration is. Yes, right? and that's the gift that of beautiful, Yeah, too. that beautiful marriage between actor and writer and director. If, you could, if we could all even be in the Zoom room around that. It is not about um, the moment to moment of like the scene because that's really hard to recreate. But I think it is about everything that leads up to that. And great directors, I think Lori, one of the great things about Lori is that, you know, she, she's building into that. There's those questions are really important questions that build into how do we make this? And I think that's what community work is. The possibility of what we're able to make, right? Um, so that's, that's where I'm working from. Uh, this is all about the possible. So if you can be in the possible, and you know, really I'm talking cl uh, kids off ledges right now, right? Because they're like, oh, just, ah, ah. and you're like, you know what? This is just another space. Mm -hmm. And this is a room in which you and I get to really be with one another in a very, very deep way. So yeah. how do we use this room? Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're doing is, an even kind of more grassroots approach because we were all coming to the culmination of the community classes that we were having, but they were not built 
up for a virtual landscape and not everybody um, had the capacity to engage with each other. Some people are still rehearsing their scenes because we're going to pick up when we come back, we're gonna pick up and do a big public works palooza and everyone's gonna come back and we're gonna rehearse and bring all that works that works not going anywhere. So people are continuing to cook on that, knowing that we will come back and do it. But we pick up the phone and we call people and um, our, um, our showing up is in conversation, is in that one-to-one, -one, you know, as I call it, the hand stitching of like, how are you? How are you doing? What do you need? What's going on? You know, and finding out what they need and trying to then direct them and connect them to, to that. So to me, it is the, the art of community, the art of um, truly walking the values that we say that we hold in this time, because, um, you know, that, that is the bedrock of this work, you know, and I just think of our larger institutions. It's like, how do we show up now in this time is going to directly affect what happens when we come out of it because we're not going to be the same god god hoping we are not going to be the same because i think it's an opportunity for us to be um deeper yeah very good point um well the we're all very lucky to have you both in our communities uh in closing can I ask you both to share something you've learned or discovered during the quarantine period that you plan on incorporating into your practice as an artist moving forward at post COVID? <laughs> Louise? Okay, I was thinking that, Laurie. <laughs> oh, I, I can go first, I guess. I mean, Louise will say something brilliant. No, I won't. Something I won't. I'm, I'm begging for like time. Freaking crap. Like, I'll just say something like, ooh. Um, uh, I, for me, it's, it's, the, it's really simple. It's like, I've, I didn't feed myself. And I take that word feed in a lot of ways is I think this being Latina, being female, being a Gemini, <laughs> coming from a large family, being first generation, the, the, the list piles up. Service is paramount and service to the point of sacrifice. And the more you sacrifice, the more you are doing the work. So that's the Catholic too that I forgot to leave out. So, um, so I, it's like give until you've got nothing left. And I think something as simple as learning to feed myself every day, several times a day, not just in food, but like I've been cooking and I, you know, I've been shopping and I've been mindful about that. And also trying to, what else am I feeding like my head and my heart? Um, because you know, I'm not gonna lie, it's been, it can get really dark. And I think the last several weeks, I've shared this with Luis, have been um, very hard. I think the first, it was like momentum that was moving me through the first seven or eight weeks of this. And now, what are we, the 11th week in? I don't even, I mean, that, you know, so, you know, I do daily writing just to, even it doesn't have to, it's, the rule is it doesn't have to be brilliant and it's not supposed to be brilliant. It's like clock the day, clock who you spoke to, yeah. you know? Um, so I think it's it's about how, I, I hope that I will continue to feed myself, which sometimes will also mean not working 80 hours a week, but walking away from your desk and going home at a decent time and calling your friends on the West Coast that you haven't spoken to in a very long time, because at the end of the day, this work takes a lot out of you. And I find that I work and then I crash and then I start over again. And we have to build up our stamina. We have to be warriors in this time. And so that's my, that's my takeaway. It's wonderful. Okay, so brilliant beautiful. man. No, I, I'm, I just I want to maybe jump on that because I want to say that one of the things I believe about art is that 
it is a three-part process, conceptualization, production, and presentation, right? And conceptualization seems like the most indulgent part of it. So we don't practice it very often, right? I live in an apartment that has no television. I haven't had TV for four years. I never, that's not like some badge of honor. It was just that I was always at theater or making theater. I was always out every single night. I just always was in the theater. And then, um, and then this moment happens and you realize it's not a, it's not, a, I, I didn't, I got Netflix for like one week just to try it. Cause I thought uh, this could be deadly. And then I saw Tiger King, like one episode. And then I was like, mm, this, this is probably not the right thing for me right now. Right. But what was the right thing was to go back and start a play from a place that it should be started from. So it's not a surprise to me. I'm doing a piece for the Geffen about a, a stuttering puppet who lives in a kind of silence of language. That totally makes sense that I'm working on that. And then I'm doing a piece about, you know, silent meditation at a, at a, at a um, seminary. Yeah, that's not a surprise either. And both of those really required a lot of really deliberate meditative thinking which is not something I could ever bring because like Lori, I agree. I was the crash and you know, the, I, I go, 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 go. And then I burn and then I start again. And I do, I do not want to go back to the world that, that existed for me, which is busy is not better. Busy is productive, but it's yeah. not deep. And one of the things I've learned in this, in these last few months is that um, getting deep it requires real thinking and requires real time and requires this thing called prayer, which we, you know, and I'm not speaking about this religiously in organized religious, but I, I need to have the prayerful meditation. I need to be really, really inside of a character. I need to be really thinking about what uh, the manifestation of an action is, you know, event, all of those things that are in playwriting that you kind of just quickly go through, right? And, um, but this has really changed. It's changed. I can see myself being a better artist. I'm a better teacher for sure, right? I, I'm shocked that I was able to take this many students through such a deep, deep, uh, powerful exercise. I didn't just cradle them and babysat them. We might, Playwriting One students wrote full length, like over a hundred pages plays that are the most amazing plays ever. They're, none of them take place in a porch or in a kitchen or in a living room. They're all going to extraordinary places because the moment demanded that. And if the moment demands for you to stop, please stop because I'm stopping. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I just want to say one more thing. The uh, Denver Center yesterday just announced, you know, they weren't doing my play. And I thought I was going to like break down. And instead I went, Oof, thank uh, you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you both so much. Everything was so inspiring and illuminating. And we're so lucky to have you. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you um, for this opportunity and this invitation and for everyone who showed up. Totally appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. I also, I want to thank Alan Wittaborg, who is our ASL interpreter. He's amazing. He's doing an amazing job. We'd also like to acknowledge our longstanding partners. So Stage Directors and Choreographer Society, Pasadena Playhouse, and Boston Court Pasadena have been supporting us for years and years, and we look forward to reuniting with them next year. We miss them, and we look forward to seeing them next year. By the way, this conversation will be archived and available with closed captions at both HowlRound.com and DirectorsLabWest.com. So please tell your friends. We hope you'll join us again tomorrow for a conversation between Sabra Williams and Laura Carlin. They will be discussing the power of the arts, theater, and dance in systems impacted communities. So that should be very good. We hope to see you for that. Thank you so much for being with us today. We hope this conversation sparks more. Thanks friends. Bye.